This episode is brought to you by Blood Lubricants. If you're a regular listener to the Dirt Tracker podcast, you've been hearing me talk about Blood for a few weeks now. While Blood might be a newer brand name, the guys and technology behind it certainly are not. The folks behind Blood have decades of experience making high quality lubricants, and their technology and products have a proven track record across many industries and applications. You can take advantage of their knowledge and experience to keep your race car performing at its best with their line of high quality synthetic racing oils. And don't just take my word for it, I'm just a dirt racing fan with a podcast. What the hell? do I know about racing oils, but who you should listen to are guys like Corey Eliason, Danny Dietrich, and Craig Kinzer. These are serious professional racers with a ton of race wins on some of the biggest stages. They all trust blood products in their race cars. To see the full line of blood lubricants and accessories, visit bloodlubricants.com. That's B-L-U-D lubricants.com. If you'd like to receive 25% off most products, use code DIRT at checkout. That's D-I-R-T, all caps, at checkout. All right, joining me right now on Dirt Tracker Conversations, Brad Loyette. Brad, I guess we'll start kind of just like at the beginning and, and we'll kind of take the listeners kind of all the way through, you know, your racing career. But uh, start me out with, with, you know, where you're from and, and how you kind of get started racing. So I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, always hailed from Sunset Hills, Missouri, which was where I was, uh, you know, when I really was racing. Um, so how it basically started was kind of my mom's fault, which is funny because at the end of the day, I think she was probably happy that racing ended. But um, as far as racing was, um, me and my dad, we were huge race fans. We used to travel and go to probably 80 shows a year just watching races. And then one day he was like, hey, you want to you give this a try? Is this something you'd be interested in? And next thing you know, we, we had a micro and we raced like maybe 25, 30 times the first year. Like it was supposed to be like once a month, like just something to go do. And then it turned into like, this is addicting. And then like my second year racing micros, I raced over 125 shows. So it was like from completely green, no idea what to do on a race car to we were racing full time, essentially. From there, we transferred into racing USAC Focus Midgets, which I did for a year at the end of that, I ran my first uh, national show. I went out to Tucson and Irwindale and ran both those pavement shows. And then we ran midgets up until, geez, probably 2010-ish era. And then we, we got a sprint car. And, you know, we as far as financial goals of racing go, if you want to make money, it really has to be in a sprint car. And, yeah, that's when we first got our, our, our big sponsor. We ran the ASCS National Tour. We, we started running a lot more 410 stuff and all the way up until I got hurt, I, I raced. So, um, you know, then I, I did get hurt here at the shop and kind of, you know, that ended it, you know, there was no more racing. I did go and run chili bowl, uh, one last time. And it was like the most painful thing I I've done in racing, just as far as my hand goes, it was just, it just doesn't work like it used to. So, um, now I, I own my own business building race car parts and building parts in general. We have our own uh, machine shop fabrication shops. We have three CNC machines here, a bunch of manual machines, welders. I mean, you name it, we can, we can build pretty much anything. So that's my main focus now is building my business and trying to, you know, take over the world essentially is what I always tell people. When you are running micros, like what tracks are you going to? I mean, are you sticking pretty close to home? Are you, were you guys able to kind of get out and travel in those first couple of years? So the biggest thing we did is I did race a couple of tracks that were close to home, like Farmington and Doe Run. They were, you know, within an hour, hour and a half of home. But the biggest thing that my dad always said is we need to go to other tracks. You can't be fast if you're racing the same place every single weekend. Cause you, you see a lot of those types of people who are like one track wonders where they're really good at this track and you take them out of that situation and now they're lost. So I think that was probably one of the best things we did early on is we tried to travel as much as we could to as many different racetracks and it allowed me to adapt to tracks a lot faster than probably some other people did. And I think that's what helped helped me on the national tour. It always seemed like with ASCS, when we'd go to a track that nobody had been to, we were always the ones that seemed to be on our game the, the fastest, you know, not saying we were the best every night, but you know, we were definitely on our game quicker than most people. And I think that was just adapting. And I think that's a, a skill that a lot of kids that, our racing need to try and do is get out of their comfort zone and race more places. What do you, th uh, what is it about the micro that you think is a good platform to get started on? And, and, you know, what knowledge can you kind of take from what you learn there as you move up? So micros, first of all, are just a ton of fun. Like if there was ever a situation where I decided I wanted to get back in a race car, it would be in a micro just because it's fun. Um, 
the the thing about them that is good is a lot of the cars now are are set up just like sprint cars. You know, everybody's kind of going to that technology of let's make a miniature sprint car, which it hadn't always been that way, but now I think almost everybody's that way. And the micros, one thing that has changed dramatically from when I race micros to what's going on now are the engine costs, and I think that's the same just across the board in racing in general. But um, you know, hopefully they find a way to make you know an entry level, you know, make motors affordable for micros because I mean, they're racing for, you know, 750 bucks is a big show on a regular week. You know, they do have a lot of 10,000 win races, but, um, that's a, that's an area that they need to try and improve. And that's an area that in general racing try, needs to try and improve, you know, purses haven't changed in years, but the costs are going way up. So. Did you find it when you went from the micro to the sprint car, did you find it a big leap or did you get comfortable pretty quickly? So I actually went from the micro to the focus midget and the focus midget, I think taught a ton of bad habits. It was just very underpowered. There was no, you know, there was, it seemed like there was more power to weight ratio in a micro than there was in the focus midget, which, which killed me. Um, what did help with the focus midget was keeping the car straight, keeping speed up. So I think that's why we did so well when we first got into the national midget scene with, with the pavement car actually was, we you had to keep your momentum up and that's where guys like you know cody swanson bobby santos you know everybody can go down the straightaway fast but those guys seem to get through the corners quicker than just anybody and i think that's uh, a skill that i did develop from the the micros or from the focus cars but moving forward like if say i had a kid who wanted to get into racing i think i would almost skip all that stuff i would go from a micro straight to a sprint car i wouldn't even mess around with midgets at all i mean i love midgets they were my fa my passion but um as far as building a kid that's going to go fast in a race car, I think you just got to go from a micro straight to a sprint car. What's the difference like horsepower wise between like, you know, the, what, what was those focus midgets, you know, up to, you know, a full blown power eye or USAC national midget? You know, I don't remember what the focus cars put out, but I mean, the midgets were, I mean, it had to be twice the horsepower I'd imagine. I mean, the focus cars were, they were turds. I mean, there was nothing there. I mean, you had to step on the gas and wait a second for them to get going. I mean, I think the D2 cars that are out there now are, are way better than what the focus cars were with like those honda motors i mean there's Hon guys running the hondas that are basically out of a junkyard essentially to start off that are being fairly competitive in the national scene i mean i don't know what that ethan mitchell has but his is running pretty good and there's a kid over here who has one that out of the uh, enviro fab team that it runs really well i mean he won a national show with power eye as far as heat race goes but you know they're, they're getting to get that technology and hopefully it works out so as you kind of look at like what midget racing is right now, was it the same when you were kind of first coming up or has it changed quite a bit, you know, in terms of drivers, teams, things like that? Well, it's definitely changed as far as like uh, super teams go. I mean, Keith comes with, you know, six cars. Um, Chad's got three cars every night. I mean, not to say that wasn't there when I was racing midgets, you know, KKR had sweet um tsr had levi and josh wise so i mean there were those teams there was steve lewis you know so there, there were those big teams but i think now is and it's the same with the outlaws is everybody can go buy the exact same thing now i mean there's nothing that's like you know you can't get this anybody if you've got enough money you can walk in and you can buy that that car that motor those parts and, it, and i think that's changed a little bit from what it was but I, I think midget racing now is probably the healthiest it's been as far as car counts go. I mean, there is a big spread between your, you know, Tucker boat and your local guy that's racing at Belclair on a Saturday night. And that that's always going to be there. There's no fixing that. There's always going to be somebody that's got more money that's going to spend it. So I think a lot of people think that's a big issue, which, which it is. I mean, cost is a big issue, but I mean, if you've got it, you're going to do it. It's the same thing if that guy had the money. He would go get that motor and get that car. He, he could, but he just can't. But uh, as far as midget racing goes, it's healthy right now. It's exciting to watch, that's for sure. I mean, you saw how the USAC deal ended last weekend. So you know, it's good times. Do you think that that parity is a good thing? I mean, you know, I guess you could look at it one way and be like, well, you know, if everybody's cars are fairly similar, you're going to see who really the best drivers are. Um, but then like, you know, in terms of obviously innovation and things like that, there's just not much going on. So do you like, do you think that parity is good? Uh, I do. I mean, I like, I live for the guy who can make his car go faster than somebody else. So, you know, like, I, like a guy like Jerome Rodella, like the dude is super smart. He was a good race car driver when he ran, you know, he took Thorson. Thorson had an idea of running the four coil car. Is it something I'm a fan of? No. Is it working? Yeah. Do I think it's kind of smoke and mirrors in a situation where they're both doing the same thing? I mean, they had Edmunds cars back in the eighties. It was the same technology. And we, we went to, you know, bar cars and 
you know, good shocks. So to me, I think um, it, it is exciting and I live for that. Like, and I always wonder like, who is the smartest guy in the pits? Like, I appreciate the guy who could build a car. Like, look at Chad. I mean, Chad raced. Now Chad is building his cars at his shop. He's setting them up by himself and he's winning. You know, I mean, he took that, he took a situation where he could have kept racing, but he's turned it into a business for himself. And I appreciate that. And Chad's a customer of mine. So obviously we're rooting for him, but I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting to see that play out now, as opposed to a guy that's got a bunch of money, who's renting a car that might, you know, Hey, they got it. They're doing it. But to me, they're not learning anything out of it. I mean, there's guys that are spending a lot of money to drive some race cars on the national tour that um, they're not, they're not getting anything but a check stub afterwards where some of these guys are at least learning something and making something out of it. I, f I feel like, and, and, you know, like I haven't been following midget racing, you know, more than probably three, four, five years. Um, but was midget racing always kind of like it looks to be right now where it's just kind of the step stone into, you know, pavement racing or, you know, on your way to the outlaws, like, you know, it, it doesn't seem like there's all that many guys that are kind of around to stay. And like, was it like that when you first came in? Yeah, I mean, there's like, I mean, look at Jerry Coon Jr. He's still hanging around midgets. But um, I think if you want to make money, you midgets aren't where it's at. It's just not. I mean, it, it is a stepping stone. It gets you there. But if you want to make money racing dirt, you've got to either be running a late model, it seems like, or be racing a sprint car. I mean, I, I think that's your only option. So, I mean, midgets are a ton of fun. They're awesome to watch. But as far as, you know, making a living racing midgets, you're not going to do it. I mean, nobody's going to make a living racing really. But as far as, you know, giving yourself a, a fighting chance with a good team and, you know, getting paid to do it, midgets aren't where it's at. I mean, in terms of even like using it as a stepping stone, is, is it even a good stepping stone? Like, I mean, if you're going to go pavement racing or you're going to go, you know, full-blown sport and sprint car racing, like, is that a good place to learn? I mean, it's, it definitely teaches you car control, but the big thing that's a lot different is, you know, back when all these guys were making it besides, you know, Larson and Bell, but those guys still did get in a pavement car and go fast. That's not happening anymore. So like you could be the fastest dude racing dirt right now, but if that doesn't transition and you can't prove it, I mean, like to me, it, it's, he's finally getting the chance, but Cody Swanson should have been in NASCAR like 10 years ago. Yeah. And the fact that he's gotten passed over just because he didn't have the money or he was really just your, your regular guy, you know, he, he didn't have anything special. He did. He wasn't a minority. He didn't have anything different than your normal guy, like me or you sitting here to offer to a sponsor other than just pure talent. And that's the thing. I mean, he was with Steve Lewis. He had those rides and they still never developed. So to me, I don't know. I mean, that's a problem that should be fixed is how do you get a guy who does have that pure talent, the chance that really deserves it. And I, I think he's getting that now it seems like, but is it too late? You know, who knows? Did you have like those aspirations? I mean, were you thinking of NASCAR or IndyCar? I mean, what, you know, what was your hope back then? Well, I think everybody has that hope when they're young and dumb and racing and having fun. I did have one really cool situation, you know, at Chili Bowl, we were sponsored by, by IndyCar one year. And, you know, part of the deal was, oh, we're going to help you get a pro series ride. So that was cool. And, you know, they did, they set it all up. And then when the car owner called me and said, Hey, here's the deal. It was like, oh, it's not worth it to me. I mean, basically it was going to cost us, you know, almost a million and a half dollars to go run like six races in a pro series car that didn't do anything. So, you know, that's kind of where I think I started to realize like my dad was my biggest backer in racing and I wasn't going to ever expect anything like that and I think there's a lot of guys that do and I think that's kind of when I started that you know the transition of I'm going to be way more hands-on I'm going to learn what I need to do I'm going to I'm going to learn these skills that are at least going to make some sort of cost difference for us so I mean yeah I, I did have those goals and then that kind of reality set in, and I was like yeah I'm not going to do that not today when you kind of start to move up, you know, you get through midgets and, and you get in sprint cars, you know, for the first time, why ASCS, like why that national tour was something that, you know, that drew you to it? Oh, uh, so basically Jesse Hockett drove our car at Chili Bowl one year. He had a, you know, he was running 360s to the ASCS. So he was within, you know, a couple hours from us. He kind of got us in line of what we needed to do. And actually after, after Jesse passed, we bought two of the motors off of, off of them. So that's what I actually started my 360 career was with all of Jesse's motors. And it, for us, um, it just made sense. You know, 360s were affordable to get into it. We got our feet wet. I, I won the, 
the regional championship the, the first year. And then we went out West and we ran the, the last races of the national tour and ASCS does a really great job. As far as tow money goes, they give you, 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 you made good money. Um, unfortunately we got into it. They kind of cut the purse, you know, the, the next year when I first started running, but before then, I mean, they, they did offer a really good purse. They had good tow money. Um, so it was a good deal. I mean, obviously I, I would have loved to run the outlaw tour. You know, I think that's something that maybe we would have done if I had not got hurt, but un unfortunately we don't know now, you know, we, we were at the point we had five good four tens and, you know, I was running mainly four tens there at the end, still doing three sixty stuff. But, um, yeah, I think to me, it would have been a blast to go run the outlaw tour. The ASCS was a ton of fun. So I can't imagine what run the outlaw tour would have been like. When you actually get to that point where you want to move up to sprint cars, it, why was wing sprint car racing the direction you wanted to go in and not non-wing? Was it just the money situation? Was it, you know, what, what was around you? Like, I, I'm always curious why guys kind of decide to go one direction versus the other. It seems like, you know, the purists are all about the non-wing stuff, but, you know, it seems like a lot more of, and, and not necessarily a lot more of the talent, but a lot of the talent and things kind of, you know, migrates more towards the wing stuff. So my mom kind of played a little bit of a role in that one too. I, I did run the non-wing car for a season. We, we maybe did like 20 shows, not a whole lot, but um, it was just a safety deal. At that time, there was a ton of people who were getting hurt racing non-wing. You know, now, you know, we've had some accidents where people have gotten seriously hurt racing wing cars. So, I mean, um, that was what it was. It was really just a safety thing. Like my mom felt more comfortable with me running a wing car. And, you know, when you think about even the money side of it, these guys that are racing non-wing sprint cars in indiana are racing for like 1200 bucks a night which i don't even know how they can do that you know it just doesn't make sense you know you could at least go around a 410 show somewhere and at least race for you know three grand you know or even a 360 show so that that was probably the deciding factors on that when you kind of get into running sprint cars and you know that transition from from that stuff into sprint cars and then i'm curious about the transition from 360 even to 410 is it like, was it a massive learning curve? Like, did it take you a while to get comfortable or, you know, did you jump right in? And you're like, okay, yeah, I know how to do this. No, it, it was actually a lot easier than I thought. I mean, there was a huge horsepower difference, but I, I ran the non-wing 410, you know, so I, I had felt horsepower before, but um, I adapted pretty quickly. My biggest thing was I was wanting to pitch the car in the corner, like a non-wing car. And so once I ironed some of those things out, it's still just a race car at the end of the day. I mean, you see a guy like Sunshine who, you know, he's ran non-wing his whole career essentially and he's getting into the wing car and you, you know if you can figure out how to drive a race car you'll figure it out type deal you know if you're good you're good if you're not you're not so yeah. you, you ran what i think you had what three power eye national championships um when you know when when do you kind of make that decision to go like power i versus usac usac versus power like i feel like you kind of get some guys that kind of have their feet in both but but why make one decision versus the other Oh, well, we actually, we ran mainly USAC for the, for the most part, you know, we did win those power ride championships, but we did it while we were also racing with USAC. And, um, I mean, we, we used to log a ton of races way more than most of these guys are doing now. I mean, um, I raced way too much with any series we could, we'd go race. I mean, some people might've called it cherry picking in some situations, but we were just racing and that's what we did. Um, I think power at USAC, they obviously have a beef with each other right now. I think if there was any way you could iron that out, midget racing would be in a better place in general i don't think that's ever going to happen just because it's it's a business and you know it is what it is but um for, for us power i was obviously closer and it's just it's just how it worked out i mean there wasn't any reason for us in in that situation that we chose power I over you said because we actually did run both at the same time and even the last power i championship i won i i won the the 360 regional championship the same year, you know, I had to pick races that we missed in both series to pull that off, but you know, we still got it done. How do you like when, when you're kind of doing both, when you're running the midget, when you're running the sprint car, like how do you decide like on a week to week basis or, you know, how do you decide on a schedule? Like, you know, do you have to get, did you have to get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm going to focus on one versus the other, or, you know, were you able to put enough together both ways to make it work? Uh, we pretty much put enough together to make it work. Uh, the, the last weekend we had, it was a three day show or two day show at the time for the Hockett Memorial and how it worked is if you, if you were there, you got show up points or something like that. So we ran the first night, made the show. I'm not even sure we might've locked it in or something. And then we actually, we were in the A main for Saturday and we just left because I had to go race the midget to, to try and win that championship. So that was probably the weirdest situation we had where we just said, okay, we got to go. And I left 
and ran Macon, Illinois. We picked up the win that night, and that kind of sealed the deal as far as our Power Eye Championship went. And then, you know, we basically had to show up for the next sprint car race to win that championship too. So. The last couple of years of your, you know, of your actual like kind of full-time racing career before you get hurt, like, I mean, what are you moving towards? Is it more, full, you know, 410 racing? Like, I'm trying to remember, like, you running, like, MOA stuff and, and you know, some of those other series that, you know, and, like, you know, obviously there were some outlaw shows and things like that in there, too. But, like, was that the direction you were trying to go was, was maybe full 410 racing? Yeah, we were for sure developing our 410 program. I mean, we had four motors, five motors, something like that at the time. Um, you know, so I did. I had my first kid. So that one year we slowed down a little bit, stayed a little bit closer home, ran MOA and picked up that championship i think and then the year i got hurt you know i just got back from new zealand so we were gearing up to do a you know another another year on the on the road you know it wasn't outlaws or anything like that but it was going to be mainly 410 stuff again and you know throw some 360 stuff in here and there but you know we were done midget racing pretty much and it was just going to focus on mainly 410 stuff I want to ask you like kind of specifically about the chili bowl and, and, you know, we were kind of talking before this, but you know, you, you had that like, you know, kind of number one pit spot, you know, everybody knew your cars and, and things like that, but well, you know, give me an idea about your kind of history at chili bowl and, and why that was an event that was, was something that was important to you to compete in and, and, you know, bring, you know, multiple cars to every year. Yeah. I mean, chili bowl, everybody knows chili bowl. It's a blast. I mean, you're not really racing for the money, obviously it's just the prestige and, um, it's a good time with, you know, every single one of your closest friends in the industry, you know, it's like PRI on steroids essentially. So for us, it's just started off. I, the first time I went there was in a focus car and we actually ran well. And then from there, it just kind of escalated. You know, we, we had an entry level midget and then we got, you know, pretty high caliber stuff. And then it ended up, somebody calls up and says, Oh, Hey, can you know, I run a second car? And you know, one car turns into two cars, turns into six, you know, so it got out of hand pretty quick. And Chili Bowl was a, a ton of work for me, but it was also really rewarding. You know, that's when I really kind of got my first taste of like, even if I wasn't successful that week, if I put a car in the show or we had somebody run really well, at least I had that satisfaction that I, I got to do that. I made that car go fast. So, you know, we always prided ourselves. I, I don't know how many times we had a car show up that, you know, had a mechanical failure it'd have to almost be zero you know so that was something that we kind of you know took a lot of pride in that we you know built really good cars we had really good drivers and we had good runs you know we never picked up a win with with me or anybody else but it was you know we were always contenders I felt like every time we went there I, I I'm curious about the work you you talked about there and and you know knowing Brian Dunlap for as long as I've known him like I mean the guy works all year on two yeah. it's for one event but like when you have that many cars to go to Chili Bowl I mean like what does the work really look like I mean I mean how many weeks months in advance are you starting on stuff to be prepared for January in Tulsa so our goal was we always take off the week from uh this you know Christmas to New Year's and the the goal was always to have every single car fired up ready to go before Christmas so it was whenever we started which was usually after turkey night was you know we had a month then that we had to get every car ready to go you know we would usually always build a brand new car that I'd usually run and that one would be the one that would require the most work the other cars were basically up on the shelf that we just pull down go through main maintenance get everything cleared out fire it up, put it away, and then we're good to go. So it was about a month time for us. I mean, I bet you a guy like Keith right now is probably already getting prepped for it. But, um, you know, it's it's a different world. There's a lot more cars showing up. I mean, the amount of super teams now compared to 10 years ago is, you know, quite a bit different. You know, it used to be, you know, like us, Keith, Wilkie, were probably the three cruisemen. And then now it's like there's five or six teams that are bringing, you know, over five cars every year. So it's, it's, it's pretty substantial, you know, maybe one of these years, you know, Nimit can pay like 50,000 to win for it and make, make it worth everybody's while instead of just the prestige, but we'll see. I, one of the things actually that I had have had multiple conversations with Dunlap about even is like, I feel like every year there's somebody who ends up losing an engine and then like, it's like you're running around scrapping, trying to find an engine. And it blows me away that with that many cars in the building, that there's like not really enough engines to go around. And I'm, like, yeah. when you like look across the country, at like how many midgets actually compete like fairly regularly. And then like how many actually show up to Chili Bowl? Like, how is it that there just isn't enough stuff? Like, it just yeah, it's like, where did all this stuff come from? Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we talk about that all the time, you know, because there's sprint cars, you know, there'll be what 400 cars that race a weekend across the United States, but then, you know, 300 midgets show up for Chili Bowl and it's like, you know, a, a normal weekend, there's 50 midgets racing across the country. So it's like, where do all these cars come from? So 
And it is always, it is crazy we, we always like you know do you like start a business where you like just build engines and then like just rent them out like one time a year like could yeah. you make enough money like doing that but um i i, I want to talk about your your accident and, and it's like it's kind of crazy to me to think that you know somebody who you know races raced as long as you did and like you kind of look across the landscape of of you know injuries from racers and it's like if you are going to say that somebody was a driver that, that ended up injured like you don't think that they got injured in their own shop yeah so, like how crazy of a situation was it and like walk me through what happened that day um so i was supposed to be going down to florida i was taking a kid down there to race his midget uh we were prepping getting everything ready to go we were basically basically done we just had to mount some tires um i was actually on the very last uh wheel and tire ready to you know blew it up didn't didn't seat you know pulled it back down lubed it up um I had my my helper come over take a look at it we you know oh it looks okay aired it back up i probably had about three seconds worth of air in it and just boom life changed instantly at that moment it was uh i mean i don't know how to explain it other than it was like pearl harbor like you're watching the movie and like you know this guy has a concussion of sound he can't hear anything don't know what's going on and then i look down and i see my wrist and it's just like down here and it's like okay, we better call the ambulance. So, you know, I, I never panicked. I didn't go into shock. You know, at that moment I looked at my hand and I said, okay, you've, you've lost your hand. It's not, they're not going to be able to fix this. Like it's toast. So how can we make sure that nothing else happens? So I just basically walked into the office where I'm sitting right now, sat down, waited for the ambulance to show up, which took literally felt like forever. And, you know, at, then I, then I maybe went into a little bit of shock because I'm like, okay, there's somebody here to help me, which turned into, they didn't do anything for me until later that night. Um, so I had emergency surgery the day of, I broke both bones in my wrist, uh, twice. I, it spun around 360 degrees from where it was initially. Um, so yeah, it was pretty messed up obviously, but it, um, you know, I had emergency surgery the day of to come out and the doctor says, oh, he's good to go. You know, he'll regain full mobility. I mean, I had, it was pretty substantial. I'm sure a lot of people have seen pictures. So I'm thinking, Oh, that's great. You know, and I go for my follow-up appointment two weeks later. And I mean, my wrist looks like something out of a horror movie. I mean, it's just basically blood. The first time I seen it, you know, it's still pretty big gash wide open. You know, they thought they were going to have to do skin grafts. We never did, which, you know, maybe it would have been a better thing as far as my appearance of the risk goes. But basically at that point he said, okay, you know, you, you, you might not regain, you know, full mobility here. And then it's like, okay, well, what's that mean? And, you know, I started doing therapy and therapy started, uh, I went three days a week for three hours a day, every day. Um, that was the only thing I did that I left my house. I, I fell into, you know, I, at the time I didn't know it, but I fell into a pretty dark spot in my life. Probably the only time I've been in a dark spot. And, you know, I'd, I'd go there, I'd do my, my work and therapy and that, that went on for months, it's probably six months before I even kind of got back to the shop. Um, I didn't, I didn't have any desire to get out here. Um, I was scared, I guess, you know, I didn't know it, but I was scared. Um, then I, I did rent a car out then to a kid who, who was from around here and I, I kind of had to get, get back on the horse a little bit and that, that helped me. Um, my wife kind of told me you need to get, you need to get it back out there and get back to, to what is normal, which was not normal. Um, and then when I was in New Zealand, before I got hurt, Tony was down there, Tony Stewart, and we saw him out at Lakeside and he's like, Hey, you know, how's, how's the risk going? And I'm like, oh, it's not, you know, it's, it's like, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even feel half of my hand at the time. I couldn't move fingers. And he's like, oh, well, that's, that's bullshit. You know, he's like, you need to come, come see my doctor. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I've, I went to specialist upon specialist in town already, went up to Indianapolis to Dr. Fisher at the Indiana hand to shoulder center. And he, you know, he's like, oh, where's it hurt? What's it feel like? You know, I told him and he's like, oh, well, your wrist is still broken. And I'm like, nah, no, nah, there's no way, you know, and he goes, he takes an x-ray and uh, my wrist was actually still probably it was broke more that day than it was the day of the accident. So I had plates that were in my wrist that were about to break from just the, the stretching of the bones where they were basically bending back and forth. So we scheduled a surgery. I went in, he took a bone off my hip, put it back in my wrist, 
put plates back in and I, I got to where I it, literally next day I could feel my hand. I could feel my fingers. I could do things that I couldn't do the day before. And that went on. That was great. Another year goes by or six months and then pain comes back. They had to go take the plates out. And now we're kind of at the position where, um, I, I, the mobility that I have in my wrist is all I'm ever going to have. I'm not going to regain anymore, which, you know, that's as far as I can bend my wrist. So it's not, you know, I can't bend it. I can't do anything as far as you, you don't know how many times you have to bend your wrist to do much on a race car, but it's pretty often. And so now we're at the point where we're just trying to control the pain. So the only thing left to really do is they're going to go and basically snip, a ner snip the nerve that sends the pain to your brain. So I'll still have the pain, but I just won't know it. So that's where we're at right now. What was like, what, like, do you know actually what happened? Was it like, I mean, did, did the tire get you? Did the wheel get you? I mean, do you know like what the kind of like the actual damage was done from? So where the beadlock ring welds onto the wheel basically just separated from the wheel. So it just came right off the tire. You could mount on another wheel right now and go race. So. Is it like, I mean, have people like asked you, you know, like, has this been like, you know, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? You know, is, is there like, are there lessons to be learned from this? Um, so, I mean, industry standard of how to mount a wheel and tire. I mean, you've been to a race is the same way I was doing it that day. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you should have had it in a cage or you should have had a 10 foot hose on it, which is how I do it now. You know, I'm not going to make that mistake twice, but, um, you know, there's, you're never going to see people at the track airing up tires in a cage, you know, very rarely are you going to see people using a whip hose like we've used now. So, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And, um, nobody has really reached out at all as far as, um, that manufacturer, um, other manufacturers have reached out and wanted to talk to me about it, but, um, it just kind of is what it is. You know, some days you're the bug and some days you're the windshield and, you know, I was the bug for a long time. When, uh, you know, as you're kind of going through this, when do you kind of start trying to figure out what's next? And like, you know, for somebody who's put so much into racing as you have, like, you know, was it just a natural thing that you would, you know, start a racing based business? Like, did you think about, you know, becoming a Keith Coons yourself and renting out midgets and making a business that way? I mean, what, like, what was the, was the process from kind of going from that day to kind of where you are now? So at the time, you know, I was, I was starting to work on some guys' cars. I was renting some stuff out. Um, that would have been great. You know, Keith was already doing a good job at it. I don't know what I could have brought to the table that he couldn't have brought, but you know, I, I had already ordered my first CNC machine before I got hurt, but, um, it showed up like two weeks afterwards. And like I said, it sat for like six months. We didn't even, we didn't even power it up. So it was racing was just a natural progression is because that's what we knew. We knew what parts we could build and how we could maybe make them a little bit better or nicer, or, you know, just, it, it was a natural progression, you know, now we've, we've got parts for basically everything. And as far as micros midgets go, sprint cars, we don't mess with as much just because the market's a little oversaturated for us. You know, we, we've talked with Alex Bowman about doing some stuff on his sprint car that, you know, we're, we're working on here, but to me to, to do mass, production of it doesn't make sense just as far as the financials go and we're also we're branching out now we're doing a lot of stuff out of our niche of motorsports we're we're getting into defense work aerospace work industrial work that stuff pays a lot better but it's not our passion but i mean end goal is to probably always have a racing side of our parts business like that's that's what we do that's what we've done that's what we love but as far as really making money down the line, I'm leaning more towards the, you know, the other contracts that make more money for myself and my family. So what racing parts right now are you making? I know I saw like Nerf bars and things like that, but give me kind of a rundown of all the things you are making. So Nerf bars, axles, Jacob's lighters, anything you could cut, weld, fabricate was where we started. So that's still probably a, a large portion of my business. That's what we do. Um, you know, but today we built, you know, six sets of nerf bars that's just you know a, a common day uh, as far as cnc machine stuff we make steering arms ladder straps motor plates i mean pretty much anything that bolts onto a micro or midget we make right now you know we have two cnc mills a cnc lathe a bunch of manual machines so i mean you can go to our website check out all that stuff i mean we we do stuff for maxim d1 10j you know a lot of these chassis builders we're doing work for already and it, to me, that's like kind of the point where I'm like, okay, I've made it, you know, like when Maxim calls you up and says, oh, we want you to make this. Or when Chad Boat calls me up and says, hey, you know, he was the first guy that really gave my parts a, ch a shot. 
So when you, when you get a guy like that who calls you up and says, Hey, we want to use your stuff for a company. That's when you're like, okay, well we're clearly putting out, you know, quality product. And to me, that's like a stamp of approval. And that's kind of what we're going for now. And, you know, we're always trying to get that bigger fish and I've built my business off of crumbs to the bakery concept type deal is, you know, I'll take all the crumbs, you know, like with Maxim, we started off with like maybe one purchase order a month or, you know, every six months, like just, Hey, you know, I, I know you have a relationship built up with your supplier and, you know, if they get into a bind and need something, you know, we're here to satisfy that. And that's kind of what we've done. And, you know, it's done really good for me. You know, I'm okay with making that hundred dollar sale, you know, cause they all add up, you know, I'd rather have a hundred of those than $1,000 sale. So it's been good to us and, you know, I'm loving it. It's a lot of fun. And I never thought it, it took me a while to get to that place. Like I told you, I was in a spot that was like, a dark hole. You know, I didn't know if I was ever going to, you know, find that joy again. And I've kind of found that in business is it's, it's almost like a race against myself. Cause that's kind of like what I like about racing and like a sport like golf, where there's like one person that's really in control of their destiny. And that's kind of how it is in the business world. You know, I'm, I'm in control of whatever I want to do at this point. Is there going to be a point where you get to like, where you're making just so much amounts of money that you're like, you know, let's start a race team again. Like, is that possible? Well, we've actually, we've, we've kicked it around a little bit. You know, we actually just sold our last truck and trailer, sold my last 410 like a month ago. So we, we did talk about it. I'm not, we're not at that point right now. Um, it, it's something we, we did think really hard about putting a 410 together and just getting a guy like Shane Stewart or somebody who was kind of like in between rides and just hit some big money shows and go do that. But honestly, I, I don't have the time for it right now. Um, maybe when I get to that point where I'm making so much money and I have somebody else that can run the place for me, we'll do that. But right now I, I just don't have time. We've talked about it before. Like, even if I wanted to race right now, I don't think we could, we could do it with our orders and getting a race car ready to go race every week. Is there like any possibility at all that you could drive again? Or is it just like the risk is just too limiting? No, it's, I mean, I don't think people understand. Like, you know, you look at my hand right now and think it's normal, but I mean, I go home from work and my wrist is hurting like when i ran chili bowl i mean if you were in my pit area helping out us helping us out that week i mean i ran three laps and hot laps and it looked like i had a baseball on my wrist afterwards so i mean it's just one of those things where it's just vibrations just absolutely kill it i i don't think i could ever race at the any level close to what i was let alone i've been out of the car for you know almost three years now so i don't i don't i don't think there's any shot of me ever getting a race car ever again so that is kind of, it's over. Does it limit you like in, like in the shop or are you, you know, it, can you do enough that, that it, it doesn't really make a difference? So we're at the point now I have one full-time guy and then I have a, another guy who's part-time who's going to school for precision machining. So I'm lucky enough now that I do get to spend a lot of the time just on a computer programming parts and getting stuff set up, ready to go. But as far as like, I didn't weld for almost a year and uh, you know, my welding is, it's still great, but, um, I just, I can't do as much for as long. So if I want to sit down and weld, I, I have to take breaks or I got to let my wrist right, relax. And, you know, as far as like putting cars together, when we rented the car out that year, I mean, I couldn't even tighten bolts. So, I mean, it was just, a, it, it's, it is limiting for sure. I mean, I've obviously found a way to live with it, but it's definitely not, I wouldn't wish it upon my, my worst enemy. As you are building parts and, and building this business, I'm curious about kind of like the innovation of, of dirt racing and, and, you know, like how much stuff are you improving on? Like how much are you working with a guy like Chad or, you know, with one of these chassis companies to like improve parts, change design, things like that? So, I mean, that's like uh, Nick Hoffman was actually here with Kenny Wallace the other week. And he's like, man, the thing about these sprint car guys is they're just using, you know, 15 year old technology, you know, and there's these modifieds out here now that are just like, you know, laser level and everything and getting everything perfect. And, you know, it's sprint cars are, are lacking in that department. Midgets are, you know, Tanner is doing the four coil car, but that's not new. You know, it's not innovative. It's actually old technology that they're improving on. Um, so it, it is, it is odd that nothing's really happened there. We did do something with Maxim that is on all of KKR's cars or, and at least, or at least Brad sweet stuff. So to me, like nobody knows that really, except for me, but it's like, we developed uh, a mount for the radius rods and pan hard bar that, you know, they can, they can adjust it a much more precise amount than what used to be available. So to me, like, 
Brad Sweet doesn't know I built a part that went on his car that helped him win two championships, but I did, you know, so it's like stuff like that's super cool to me. I geek out over it, you know, when any, you know, Kyle Larson bought some stuff off us for the King chassis and, you know, Bowman's got all my parts on his car. So, you know, when you have literally anybody that's in NASCAR that has, it has a midget, has my parts on it. To me, it's like, okay, well, I've done something right because they don't have to buy parts for me. They could go anywhere else and go get stuff. And to me, it, it almost, it's like, they know I race. So they know that I'm going to make sure that this is right. And, you know, I'm not to say that we've done everything perfect. You know, that's happened where, you know, we've, we've built a part that just wasn't up to par, you know, but the difference is, is me and my employee here, we, we look at it and we, you know, if it's not right, it's not right anymore. You know, we don't send out stuff that's wrong and we make sure, you know, everybody gets what they need. So to me, that's, the most satisfying thing is there's, we get people who send us parts from other manufacturers say, Oh, could you make this for us? And you look at it and you're like, these people clearly didn't notice there's something wrong with it, but we can look at it and be like, how'd they send this out? You know I mean? And there's times where we could have sent a part out like that, but we just didn't. So. When you kind of look at the the situation around sprint car racing, like why isn't there more innovation? Like why haven't we seen more crazy technology engineering? I mean, like, you know, they got modifieds and lay models and wind tunnels and pull down. Yeah. And like, how come that just hasn't happened in the sprint car and midget world? I mean, I don't know. I think I have heard, you know, that TSR, you know, brought, I know Tracy brought a midget to a wind tunnel at one time. I don't know if, I think, uh, shots his car has been on a pull down rig. Maybe. I, I don't know. To me, it's, it's pretty surprising that that hasn't happened. I don't know if it's just the old mentality that, you know, it can't be improved on, or if it's just, I mean, you look at sprint car racing though, and it's, it's in a super healthy spot too. I mean, like the, the championship run this year, even though it was a weird year, was ex super exciting to watch with shoe cart and sweet and shots. And I mean, that's cool to see, but you know, I feel like obviously shots had something figured out for a really long time that everybody else figured out on. So I think obviously there's going to be somebody that's going to figure that out now to go against sweet. They're going to find something that he's done. That's, you know, maybe it's my part, but you know, maybe there's something new that th that can be done. You know, I have a couple ideas in the works that, you know, I, actually Brian Dunlap I've talked to about. So it's like it, but it's, you have to get that person to get out of their comfort zone, which is what, people fail to do and in, in life in general they get to be in a comfort zone and go try something is hard it's like well why would i do that this is working perfectly fine so you got to convince that person to do that as you kind of like have moved you know past your racing career a little bit and, and gotten into business and things i'm curious too about your you know you, you've done some blog posts and like now you're you know you're hosting your own podcast you know why branch out and do those other things you know it, it, why is that important to you um, so I kind of just got bit by the entrepreneurial aspect, I guess, of being a businessman. You know, I grew up, my dad, you know, was super successful. My mom was super supporting of him. And, you know, I'm lucky to be in that situation right now. You know, I'm, I'm busting my butt. I work long hours. I, I work every single day, it feels like. And I have a wife at home that's raising her kids. It's, you know, super supporting of all that too. So to me, it's just kind of, you know, the more people you surround yourself with that are after the same goals, as far as success might go, the better it is. You know, if you have somebody that's in your circle who is bad for you, you're not going to get better. You know, you're the average of, you know, the five people around you is what they say. So if you want to be, you know, if you want to level up, you got to be around people who are also like-minded as far as that. So I think that's kind of what I've done. You know, I, 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 joined a book club is how our podcast started basically just reading entrepreneurial business, self-help personal development type books. And it just kind of branched into, you know, the more content like that you can take in the, the more you learn and the more you learn, the, the more you grow. What, uh, like, what have you taken away from that stuff that's helped you with your business? So what's crazy is you read all these books and it's basically the exact same thing worded a little bit differently by each author. But to me, it's just hard work is literally all it is. I mean, if you want something, the harder you work for it, the, the more chances you're going to give yourself to succeed. So, and, and that was instilled in me beforehand even, but you know, you, you read these books, you, you hear these podcasts and um, interviews with people. And that's just, to me, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it too, even in the racing world, you know, you see these people who, if they want it, they surround themselves with good people. They put in the work. I mean, you can't go out to the shop once a week and expect to go race with the outlaws and content, you know, like these guys over at KKR and shots are living and breathing this stuff. And even, you know, like look at shark racing. I mean, look where they've came in the last five years. I mean, they went from, I remember seeing them roll in with two cars in that trailer and you're like, man, no way. And now, 
they're a threat every single night. As you kind of, you know, take a step back from things and, and look at your business and, and, you know, kind of where you come from and like, where do you want to go? What does the next few years look like? You know, what is, what is the future for your business? So I, I want to grow it as quickly as possible and, you know, obviously get as big as possible. I, ha I have a five-year goal in mind already. I want to, you know, I want to build my own new shop that, you know, can handle or we're already at the point that we've kind of outgrown this place. We don't have much room left. Um, I, I'm really targeting the aerospace and defense work, which is, it's tough to get, it's tough to get into that. But once you get in, it's just like, it's good work. It's, you know, it pays good money. And that's kind of our end goal is that's what we're chasing. Those are the carrots we have. You know, we've got, we've got some really good opportunities in front of us currently that, you know, that have they panned out yet? No, but are we on the, are we on that spot? Yeah. We're like right there. So hopefully we can pull it off and, that's, that's my big goal. I, I have a 15 year goal in mind too, that is to, to, to sell in 15 years. I'd like to, you know, be retired young, which is weird because I don't know if I could ever just sit at home and not do anything, but I'd like to at least sell my business in the next 15 years. I want to grow it to a point that somebody could buy it. That would be life changing type money. Well, I certainly appreciate the time today. Uh, we're kind of going on, on like 45 minutes here, and I'm sure you have plenty of work to get back to. But um, if anybody is listening to this, watching this, where can they find you? You know, where can they find your business? Like, you know, give me the kind of rundown on, on where to find Brad. So our website's just bpfabshop.com. I mean, you search bpfabshop on Instagram or Facebook, you'll find all of those outlets. And then basically just search Brad Loyette for anything else as far as looking at pictures of my kiddos. So, I mean, uh, that's all it is. I really appreciate coming on. You know, if anybody has any parts out there that need to be quoted or want to give us a chance, swing on by. Hell yeah. All right. Well, Brad, I certainly appreciate the time today and uh, good luck going forward. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm.